Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for your time this evening. I suppose if you were working with unreliable data collection on toilet rolls, the danger is it would be a tissue of lies. <laughs> thank you all very much for coming. Good night. Okay. What else can one say? Um, but thank you, Jane. That was lovely because it really does reinforce the point that I want to work on with you this evening, which is this relationship in education between the investigational process and the practitioner process, and just how close or how far apart are they, and pivotally, that crucial question which certainly I love asking at doctoral vivas, which may not occur so much at master's level, but to actually ask the candidates at a viva, has your research actually made any difference? And I think that's a very fair question to ask, because as you all know, the amount of, of energy, intellectual energy, social energy, emotional energy that goes into research is massive. It's on top of so much. And therefore, it's, is it enough just to finish the, the dissertation? Or should this lead somewhere, take us somewhere, and make something happen? And that's really what I want to explore with you. And when I was reflecting on this, I, I, I suppose that the tension that came into my mind because of my love of, uh, 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 sorry, my love of uh, alliteration, even though I can't say it, is the notion of the relationship between uh, analysis and action. And it really is, I suppose the subtitle for this evening is Analysis into Action. And that immediately, of course, leads to all sorts of clichés, doesn't it? Because one of the great clichés that's hurled at, at educational research, particularly at professional researchers, is this notion of paralysis by analysis. In other words, we get so concerned with the mechanics of monitoring the consumption of toilet rolls that we forget why we're doing the research. Yeah? And that's the issue, isn't it? That sometimes research becomes self-legitimating, self-validating, and we lose sight of its context, its impact, and so on. So we're going to explore the idea of how we translate the evidence that we generate, the findings that we um, establish into something that makes a difference, if that's appropriate. Because I'm not saying it necessarily always may be, but again, I want to raise with the issue that in education, if one is professionally engaged in a research process, then surely it must have some relevance to our core purpose, whatever that might be. And we'll come back to that issue. Now, I'm not going to talk at you for an hour, because I think at this time of day that's unfair and would push your tolerance to the absolute limit. So... I'm going to raise questions with you and raise some ideas and then give you a chance to talk with a neighbour. So are you sitting next to somebody who's potentially interesting? <laughs> if you're not sure and you wish to move, then we will have opportunities um, several times. One or two of you are now looking really worried, I have to say, and that's most unfortunate. I'm sorry to raise the issue. So... From time to time, we'll stop, have a conversation, and then towards the end of the session, towards the end of the, the hour, then I'll open up to questions, but if something really significant emerges and you really want to question and debate and so on, then please don't hesitate to do so. So, let's have a look at how we understand this very complex relationship. And I think there's no better starting point than Richard Pring. And his study, The Philosophy of Education Research, even though it's now 12 years old, is actually still, I think, one of the most accessible, powerful, comprehensive studies of the methodological and epistemological issues surrounding research and education. And if you're not familiar with it, I would urge you to really engage with it because it is the most lucid and most comprehensive study of how high-quality research works in education. That's where Pring is so good, I think, really making it work in the context of education. And I think he captures in this quotation, for me, uh, this, the, the essential elements of this evening. Because on that second line, research is of, li of little use unless it is understood and internalised. That's great. That's what we've got to do. It's not enough simply to produce the research it's got to be presented in such a way that it is firstly understood, and that's a challenge in itself, and then this process of internalisation. In other words, I begin to acknowledge the fact that this research may have implications for me and my practice and my understanding. And that immediately moves us into the issue of change, doesn't it? 
In other words, what I find in my research may have, have implications in terms of me changing, but it also has implications perhaps of you changing as well. And then secondly, at the bottom of the, of the, um, the quote there, making it a practice of a certain sort. And I find that, again, a very interesting concept. The notion is that it may be, as a result of, re of research, that one sort of practice has to be changed into another sort of practice. Because of the evidence that we've created, because of the understandings that have emerged, because of the sheer issues that we don't have any toilet paper left. I'm going to go on about toilet paper all night. That we really need to have a fundamental rethink. So, that, for me gives us the challenge that research for its own sake, if it ever exists in education, which I doubt, has to be really seriously questioned in the extent to which that every example of practice in education is based upon some sort of conceptual model, isn't it? You cannot practice without having a personal conceptual framework which informs that practice. So every time we engage in research, we are automatically looking at the theory, but then it's the way in which we are able to link that into the practice that really does raise the challenge. And that raises, I think, a fundamental issue about the context in, in, in which we're researching. Now, this next slide is taken from a really interesting document, The Case for Change. This was published by the Coalition alongside the White Paper in November um, 2010. And the, the White Paper, The Importance of Teaching, attracted a huge amount of attention but the case for change, which was published alongside it, attracted relatively limited attention, which is really sad because it was one of the very few cases where a government department has actually published the research on which it claims to be building its um, policies. Now, you know, one makes one's own judgments, and you read about the, you have a look at it and say, is this really what was intended? Is this valid research? And so on and so on. But nevertheless, there are certain assumptions in the case for change which have been directly and very dramatically the basis of a lot of what is happening in schools in this country. And the starting point for the case for change is absolutely explicit. And it's based upon, again, a range of evidence which is contestable and debatable, but which seems to have fairly wide consensual acceptance, which is basically that we, in this country in terms of educational achievement and outcomes by a very narrow definition, have a gap. And as you know, the, the Secretary of State has made closing that gap the absolute central issue in his period in office. And then this, this ugly phrase, which carries so many really powerful emotive connotations, doesn't it? This notion of the long tail of underachievement. And even, it, I think... I think I, I think this is non-partisan, this is non-party political, that by and large we as a, an education system do have an issue in that probably two-thirds, and again the debate can rage, but probably two-thirds of young people in England lead very, very good lives by a whole range of criteria. They have very, very good quality of life. They have a range of well-being, and for many of them, they enjoy excellent education in really remarkably good schools. And they succeed and they have, as I say, wonderful life chances. That leaves us with a third. And that's the worry, isn't it? That really does seem to be in denial of virtually everything that one would aspire to for an education system. Two thirds is good. But, and I was going to say in the fifth, and then I remembered, of course, we're not the fifth biggest economy in the world anymore. We, we were the sixth until yesterday when Brazil uh, um, overtook us. So we're now the seventh biggest economy in the world, ladies and gentlemen. And it goes down by the day, I have to tell you. But basically, as the seventh largest economy on earth, to have a third of children who by certain criteria are not achieving in the way that our society has deemed to be appropriate... That does raise some fairly fundamental challenges. And being somewhat naive, perhaps, can I just raise with you the issue that any professional activity, including research, which does not address that issue, may be rather missing the point. <laughs>
in the sense that if it's not informing practice so as to close the gap, then why are we doing it? Something like that. I'm not saying it has to do it, but it's an interesting way of saying, how do I justify the use of my time and energy? And so what sort of purposes does research seem to focus on? Well, you recognise all of those, and they're all valid, aren't they? I'm not sure that we will ever find out the truth about education. Probably just as well, really. <laughs> Certainly number two, number three, number four, all of those absolutely valid in terms of why am I doing this research? And of course the final one is the most <laughs> valid of all, isn't it? And that's, again, I would say absolutely fundamentally right because personal learning, personal growth, personal development are essential. But look at it, that list, and say yeah, that all of that is valid and appropriate but actually shouldn't it be that isn't that what it's really about? And that's the challenge I'd put to you. That whilst we can go through all sorts of focal points about why are we doing this research, what are we seeking to find, and pivotally, how are we looking to change practice, isn't it the starting point for any notion of policy into practice that we should have some kind of understanding of the context in which we're working, and also, if you like, and this can be the debate, the moral purpose underpinning that context. In other words, how do we respond to the context? And that raises some very, very challenging issues, doesn't it? Certainly there is an enormously rich literature, particularly in North America, around the, the relationship between um, educational research and issues around ethnicity, issues around gender, and so on. And saying, fundamentally, if this research is not in some way advancing social justice, then why are we doing it? And I think that there's a very, very interesting debate to be had around the notion of, is this research mine, for my purposes, in order to increase my understanding, or is it to enable us as a profession to move forward in such a way as to diminish the number of young people who are not succeeding in our particular school or in, in our system and so on? That's a massive debate to be had. But again, I would suggest to you that in some systems, that that is almost axiomatic. The reason why we engage in research is in order to improve our effectiveness, in order to ensure that more young people succeed. So there's some very, very problematic issues there in why we are doing this research. But there are equally problematic issues in the sense of how we um, perceive practice. And this is taken from the lecture that some of you may remember that David Hargreaves gave in um, 1996. And this is the annual TTA lecture on the future of educational research, where he compared educational research with medical research and basically said if, if medical research was at the same status and level of practice as medical research, then many of us would be dead. Now, if medical research was at the same level as educational research, then we would be dead. Simply because for most medical practitioners, not all of course, but for most, researching their own practice is axiomatic to being a doctor. Being aware of research which influences their practice is axiomatic to being a doctor. And crucially, contributing to the knowledge that informs future practice is absolutely central to being a doctor. I'm not sure that's the case in education, even now, what, 16 years after um, Hargu's speech. I'm not sure we're still not there. We're probably still not evidence-based. And if we were evidence-based, where would it take us? Well, in the first place, can we trust the evidence? We'll come back to that point. But for example, just two very simple examples, and then I'll give you a chance to have your first reflection. For it's been known for about 25 years now According to some fairly robust research done by two American researchers, Joyce and Showers, that by and large, courses don't work. Going away for the day, being um, put up in a hotel, having a nice lunch and meeting interesting people may not actually make any difference to practice in the school. 
You may, you may have heard rumours to this effect. It has all sorts of alternative positive outcomes. It gives the teacher's class a rest, which is always good. It actually gives people a bit of a day of indulgence, which is good news. But the work done by Joyce and Showers seems to point to the fact that if you actually want to change somebody's classroom practice, if you want to change their leadership behaviours, then the only thing that will do it is coaching. And that's been around for nearly 30 years now. And the issue is, the challenge is, the debate is, it seems to be corroborated over and over and over again, and yet it is still marginal to most people's practice. And a, 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 you know, so there's a leadership challenge there, because, for example, one of the key implications is that if that's true, then shouldn't leadership, whether school leadership, team leadership, leadership in the classroom, shouldn't that be fundamentally rooted in effective coaching? Because isn't, every, isn't it the function of every leader to enable change? And if we're talking about enabling change, then according to Joyce and Charles, coaching is the most powerful vehicle to do it. But it's obviously not the case. And then a, a, a further um, example, which again many of you will, will be familiar with, um, the work done by John Hattie in his book Invisible Learning, which is, as you know, the mega study of the mega studies of the mega studies of pedagogy. It is encyclopedic, it is detailed, and yet, believe it or not, colleagues, I have come across schools in the past year which do not have a copy of John Hattie's book in the staff room. Can you imagine such a thing? And again, Hattie, having looked at with his team, it has to be said, 500,000 pieces of research on effective classroom practice and synthesised and synthesised and synthesised and says the single most significant and effective example of practice is, is um, feedback. Then why don't we do it? Why isn't it absolutely fundamental? To everything that we do in terms of the interaction between teacher and learner is the fundamental one. And that raises all sorts of questions. I'm sure, you know, again, you're aware of the work done by Carol Dweck, which reinforces Hattie over and over again. And yet we're still not really engaged. So when we talk with colleagues, then is it about this is the way that it's always been done like this? Yes, well that, that, that moment when you're doing a whole school inset day and you hear a voice wearily from the back saying, we tried this in 78, it didn't work then, I see no reason why it should work now. Is it about prejudice that basically my classroom is my area to be comfortable? And therefore, irrespective of what you tell me, I will not change my practice because that's the one part of my life and my world where I have a degree of control. Whether or not it works doesn't matter. I'm comfortable, thank you. <coughs> and I know that's a parody. Occasionally, is it the case, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a, just a hint of dogma in education? It's for you to decide. But in the final analysis, we are often told it's often done from an ideological base, isn't it? The way that education policy works, the way that school strategies work, may often be based upon a particular um, ideological perspective. So as an introductory conversation, if you don't know the person next to you and you wish to be formally introduced, let us know. But just for a few minutes, please, to what extent in your experience is practice evidence-based? <coughs> okay? Is the practice in your school evidence-based or is it based on one of those? If we do research, if we teach, if we engage in educational activities, then... Surely one of the inevitable components of that is change. I mean, one of the glories of being a school teacher is to see your pupils change, to see the growth. And the magic process that sometimes takes place within the same day of the growth in terms of understanding. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, within the new Ofsted framework, you should be able to, pop, be able, you should be able to demonstrate progress and change within a 20-minute period. So, you know, no problems there at all. In many ways, change and learning are almost absolutely the same thing, aren't they? We know that when we learn something, if we learn to ride a bicycle, then essentially our neurological structures change. 
If we understand this and that, we change who we are in many ways. And so I, I would suggest to you that one of the issues in looking at the relationship between research and practice is the extent to which we recognise that the process of research is essentially a change process. And that in order to be effective in your research, you may have to change personally. But then if we look at the context in which that research is taking place, nationally, locally, within a particular institution, within your own classroom, then that also involves change. Now, I have to tell you that some of our colleagues out there are not entirely enamoured of change. One Secretary of State, about 20 years ago plus, actually came into office and one of her first announcements was to say there will be a moratorium on change. And although I have great respect for her personally, I, did, I never understood how you could actually stop change in education. It must be fundamental to it. But that means that we need to have some understanding, don't we, of the psychological constructs that we engage, how we engage with change. How are you about change? How do you feel about change and changing? What's your, what's your emotional response to change? Because that's going to have a fundamental issue upon your ability to influence practice, isn't it? If, if, if your research is going to influence practice, then something's going to change. Now, I have to confess, I love change. I, my working life is about change. No two days ever the same. I think this goes back to my childhood. My father was in the RAF. Between the ages of 4 and 14, I went to about 11 different schools and lived in 13 different homes. And at the moment, I'm living in my 35th home. But I think I'm going to stay there because next week we pay off the mortgage. <laughs> It's one of the things that happens when you get old. You suddenly find you don't own as much as you thought you did. And therefore, my own construct of change is that this is how I live. This is normal. Very rarely in my life do I have two days the same professionally. I'm not going to talk about things personally. That's for another evening. But your personal engagement with change, how comfortable are you with change? To what extent are you somebody who's open to innovation? Are you... Are you a risk taker in certain senses? Are you somebody who is willing to consider alternative perceptions? Or are you somebody who needs, who needs to be in control? Somebody who needs to be very conscious of exactly what's happening and by and large the status quo is a good place to be? Perhaps you'd like to talk to your other neighbour now. If I'm going to change, I need to be confident in why I'm changing and who are you to ask me to change anyway? And that's the integrity of research, isn't it? And that's when the, the rigour of your research becomes so important. And I think that the increasing way that we talk about the trustworthiness of research is so powerful, isn't it? Can I trust these findings? Because if they're true, then I might have to change. And that is an enormous demand. That's a huge issue to raise in, a, in professional practice. Well, can I trust a journalist? How about Polly Toynbee in this morning's Guardian on International Women's Day? Women do twice as much unpaid caring as men, so when the safety nets go, so does their independence. Of the 710,000 public employees cut, 65% of women. Since women progress higher in the public sector, expect their overall professional status to fall, etc., etc. Do we trust that? I think so. So journalists, yes, yeah, sometimes, but not always, and so on through the list. I'll accept the research evidence to the extent to which it confirms my personal experience. <laughs> yeah, and so I've had some fun recently, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, with the Sutton Trust Report on highly effective strategies that raise pupil achievement. And as you may remember, one of the key findings of the Sutton Trust Report, which corroborates a great deal of other research, is that by and large, class size makes no difference to achievement. In fact, by certain criteria, reducing class size would actually lead to a fall in standards. And one or two of you are now looking at me and saying, what planet is he on? And people say to me, well, yeah, that may be the research, but when my class is smaller, I'm a better teacher. That may be true, madam, but it doesn't mean that your, your class's achievement is going to rise. <laughs>
the number of the, the most contentious issue in the Sutton Trust report, teaching assistants have made virtually no impact on achievement. And we know some of them are awe-inspiringly good, but by and large, they make impact on all sorts of things, but not on achievement in many schools. So counterintuitive, isn't it? If my classes were smaller and I had more adults in, I could be a brilliant teacher. In fact, take away the children and I would be absolutely <laughs> fabulous. The advice of a trusted friend, always powerful. The advice of a GP, it's, it, it never pays to become friends with a GP, does it? I, had one, I once had a GP who became a very good friend and one evening after a couple of bottles of very good wine, he turned to me and said, John, do you realise that in my final exams of the first part of the medical training, I got a third. I said, well, by most um, university criteria, that means you scored about 55%. He said, yeah, that sounds about right. I said, which 45% did you fail on? <laughs> because I need to know to speak to one of your colleagues. <laughs> so even when we have the badge, even when we have the status, it may be we still can't be trusted. On what basis are you prepared to accept evidence in order to change, please? Back to your neighbour. If we're really going to become evidence-based, if we're really saying that the purpose of research is to inform practice, then one of the things we've really got to challenge is this issue of personal intuition and common sense. Yeah? Um, more than one Secretary of State has rubbished research in education, simply saying, well, it doesn't coincide with common sense. And whose common sense are we talking about here, please, sir? And there's all sorts of issues around the notion of, you know, the common sense view is. And it's massive, isn't it? It's a huge challenge for us, maybe because we're not used to talking about evidence. <laughs> One of the great privileges of my working life has been to work with schools where a substantial proportion of staff are doing some form of school-based research. And they are magical institutions to work with. Quite different, because the level of discourse is totally different. Because we are, people are talking about evidence in a way that links it into practice, in a way that relates it to what is it we're here to do. And then I think we begin to see something very important, very powerful happening. But again, it's about the trustworthiness of evidence, it's about the integrity of the researcher, it's about the appropriateness <coughs> of what's been found, and, but pivotally, its persuadability, its stickiness. Yeah, that seems to be one of the pivotal issues. Is this going to really make a difference? Will people buy into it? So let's have a look at a couple of examples. I'm sorry this is a fairly busy sheet. I apologise for that. The next one's even worse, and I apologise in advance. Let's take up those a couple of examples of... What, for me, are some really compelling pieces of research, and I use them a great deal in my own work with schools. The work done by Carol Dweck on self-theories, basically saying the way that teachers interact with the pupils in terms of feedback on their work has got this most enormous potential impact for good or ill. And in fact, the well-meaning teacher says, what a clever boy you are, you've tried so hard, you really have achieved well, this is a lovely piece of work, may actually be damning that child to a life of delusion. Rather than saying, why didn't you try this? Have you thought about that? If you did more of this? In other words, the notion of challenge. The work of John Hattie, which again, I mean, the book is encyclopedic, and it's vastly detailed, and no human being could ever read it from cover to cover, I don't think. But its authority is amazing in terms of the way in which it presents us with very, very detailed, systematic, consistent evidence which demonstrates how certain strategies are more effective than others. And then if you want a perfect piece of triangulation, the work done by Higgins and his colleagues at the University of Durham, which says, let's look at the impact that certain strategies make in terms of the achievement of children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And lo and behold, the same story comes through again, over and over and over. The challenge, as I see it, ladies and gentlemen, is basically how much evidence do we need before we begin to contemplate changing practice? 
And I think it's a very real issue because that personal idiosyncratic approach, that habituated personal practice, that really is at the heart of a lot of what goes on in education, isn't it? The fact that we are so deferential to personality in the classroom, aren't we? You know, here am I in my classroom. My teaching is an extension of myself. That's why you better not challenge my teaching because in doing so you're challenging me. That's really hard, isn't it? Working with new heads, they've said the one thing that in the job which they found the most challenging was to talk to a colleague about their practice. Simply because you don't understand, you don't know, I, it works for me, etc., etc. And I'll confess immediately that when I first started teaching an A level, and you're looking around for a model. How do I do this as a teacher? Compared, you go back five years to when you were a student, and you say, oh, yes. And in the 1960s, believe it or not, teaching A-level was dictating notes. <coughs> day after day after day. And don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, that will be returning soon. <laughs> so we have some very compelling, by most criteria, evidence. But that, which may require significant change in order to respond to it. And there, I think, is where your research, if you're looking at issues around classroom practice, say, my research, surely, it, it, you know, John Hattie's work is so far removed from the day-to-day -day life of my school. That you know, the Carol Dweck, her work is so rooted in a different culture to ours. But then isn't the purpose of your research to bridge the gap and isn't that why practitioner research is so powerful and so important? Because you take the generic and make it specific. And that, I think, is something really compelling. So, and, and then also, let's think about trust. Simply because it's one of the most powerfully emotive co concepts, isn't it? And the work that's been done on trust, in the context of educational leadership in particular... <laughs> is awesome, I think, and again, powerful. But how on earth do we get to the point where we can take a piece of research on something as elusive a human quality as trust and say, I'm prepared to change? Well, let's think, here's what, I, 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 I do, I, I do apologise for this, but basically I just wanted you to have that taken from Carol Dweck's website just because it makes the point so compellingly that over and over again there, are, there, are, there is evidence which points to change the practice and student achievement changes. And that, that takes us back precisely to where I started. We have a tale. That tale is the product of one mode of practice which works well for some but not for all. And therefore, surely, practitioner research has to actually engage with those areas where it doesn't work. And if you have a chance to look at that, then you see that there are things in there which are based upon hard, hardly, uh, very, very challenging um, detail of what happens in highly effective classrooms. The Sutton Trust Report focuses specifically on disadvantaged children and says, use this strategy. And, and if you haven't had a chance to look at the report, it's on the Sutton Trust website. It's powerful stuff. And they say, basically, number one, feedback like that. Number two, cognitive development and challenge. Teaching children to think. Giving them a cognitive toolkit. And thirdly, getting peer learning going. Those three are high impact, low cost. Now, what would it take to get them working in your school? So there are all sorts of issues around classroom practice. Equally, the work done, sorry, the work done by Tony Brick and his colleagues, first published in 2002 and then wonderfully revisited in 2010 in terms of publication, saying that if you look at schools which are disproportionately successful in certain contexts, it's trust that makes the difference. And the really powerful thing in the 2010 study is you take all of the components that we know about in terms of school improvement, but as he says here, 
if you lack the social energy of trust, it won't work. And so expect any day now a missive from the department saying you will be required to trust each other more. We will have a national standard for trust. Trust me, it'll work. And there's the challenge, isn't it? Because how on earth do we corroborate that kind of evidence? How on earth do we begin to come to terms with the notion of we, if we're really going to be successful, we change our practicing classrooms in certain ways and then we change the way that we perceive the work of leaders into basically creating a high trust community. And that's very challenging. Well, it is challenging because maybe we don't spend enough time talking about it. It is challenging maybe because we are not actually exploring implications of talking about a trust-based community in a way that would give us confidence to see how it would work in practice. So I would argue that, and of course there are multiple other examples, those are just two of my favourite areas at the moment, whereby you have meta-research, global research, which by and large it's why we do our literature reviews, is it not? To demonstrate that we are aware of that context, that's the context, that's the conceptual context, and then we show how it applies within our own situation. That, for me, begins to help us bridge the gap between the, the theory, the principle, and the actual practice. But only if researchers are actively engaged with colleagues in dialogue around those key issues. So I return to my basic question. How, how evidence-based is what we do? To what extent are we using the vocabulary to what extent are we embedding these concepts into the way in which we perceive practice, roles, and so on? In other words, to what extent is it actually becoming part of the way the school functions? And the only way to do that, of course, is to change the discourse, to have a new vocabulary. So just reflect for a few minutes, if you would, on any examples, any evidence you have of how the generic, the broad, the, the global becomes funneled down into your school or, or alternatively what is the basis on, on how your school functions now where does it come from what's, what's the conceptual framework that underpins the way that your school operates please so the notion is that as researchers one of the most compelling things you can do is to make sense of and then apply and then where appropriate change practice within an area in which you have significant influence. And that must be, I think, one of the highest levels of professional practice. But it does raise the issue, doesn't it? Because you know, teachers are very properly, very cautious, and often very cynical people about, here's another new idea. And this raises the issue, really, of what constitutes evidence. And I think, for me, the best way that I find to think about it is that, on the one hand, you've got the hard scientific DNA type evidence, although now, of course, that's been questioned as well. And over here, you've got the circumstantial evidence. And in between, you've got varying degrees of confidence. And I think, for me, that the real issue about evidence is, A, its trustworthiness, and on the basis of that, B, the level of confidence that I have in order to inform my capacity, my propensity, my willingness to act. And so if you think of it, the vast majority of you in this room, or, 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 sorry, of us in the room, when we go to see our doctor and the doctor says, here's a prescription, we're pathetically grateful, aren't we? <laughs> Not many of us actually say, right, side effects now, please. Uh, uh, you know, how was the trial? Who conducted the trial? <laughs> You know, and so on. We just say, thank you for taking away my pain. So it's very much about credibility, isn't it? It's very much about confidence. Evidence is based upon sometimes hard data. And there is always this aspirational, this aspiration to be objective, isn't there? I really am not convinced about the notion that we can ever be objective about a classroom. It's such a complex place, isn't it? Schools are extraordinarily complex. So let's not kid ourselves that by doing lots of number counting, we're going to be objective. But it may help us to be less subjective. Is that acceptable? So we have one more piece in the jigsaw 
which helps us make up our mind, which shows us that certain bits of quantitative data actually do give us confidence in a particular strategy. And that's the issue, for example, about the class size debate. You know, if we're going to reduce class sizes from an average of 30 down to 20, how many more teachers would we require? About 150,000. Are they all going to be outstanding? Probably not. Therefore, will they raise standards? No. The numbers are there, aren't they? And we can explore their implications and meaning. And then we go over to the other side. And for example, nothing is compelling in education often as seeing another teacher doing something, yes? The modelling, the case study. And if I see it working in another school, that's why movement between schools is so powerful and important, isn't it? If I can come into your classroom and watch you use this, this feedback approach, then I'm more likely to change than reading Carol Dweck. Aren't I? And that's, again, I think has to inform how we approach this issue, that not only do I gather the data, but I also demonstrate the, the confidence level in that data, and then on the basis of that confidence level, suggest that the, here are ways forward in terms of making it actually work in practice. Does that make any sense? Uh, you, I've, I've realised you've been sitting still for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if we can get enough evidence, then maybe when the confidence is relatively low, it may simply help me understand better. And I think that's perfectly valid and appropriate. But surely we can go one step further. I can engage with my colleagues. And that's where this notion of the school as a learning community, I think, is so compelling and so powerful. We start having conversations. We, st we engage in dialogue. And immediately, we begin to influence policy and practice, don't we? The very fact that we're talking about what works, the fact that we're sharing practice, the fact that we are comparing experience, the fact that we're modelling feedback for each other, that makes the difference. At some point, somebody will change. The basic laws of evolution tell us that. And therefore, we are looking to then capture that, consolidate that, and then we can begin to, I believe, to really bring in new practices, whether in terms of classroom practice or leadership practice and so on. We then evaluate and consolidate, and then we embed it through conceptual practice. That's a very challenging list. But I think that that's really what we're about. The more we move from personal understanding into this notion of embedding consensual practice, the more likely it is that we'll see real differences being achieved in schools. Of course, there are problems. The context is a, a, a key issue, isn't it? What's the history of this school? How open is the school? What's the, the level of dialogue like in this school? One of the things, again, from new head teachers reporting often is that one of the first things they do is simply, as a new head, is have to make a school safe, get certain basic things in place, get the fundamental systems and structures right, and then start work on the culture. And the context is absolutely paramount. Is this research relevant to our needs? In other words, is it way out in the academic left field where it is undoubtedly intellectually satisfying and personally fulfilling, but whether in fact it is professionally relevant is another matter altogether. And that relevance, of course, is an enormous factor in credibility, isn't it? What are the drivers behind this research? Well, at the moment, for example, one of the key imperatives with the Sutton Trust research is the way that Ofsted is reformulating accountability in this country. You know, the notion of progress in lessons is now becoming fundamental. That's a key driver, I would suggest to you. You know, that um, schools which were outstanding are now, in, um, uh, you know, are now satisfactory simply on the basis of progress. You know, the first month or so of Ofsted is demonstrating that. That gives us a real imperative, doesn't it, to say it's relevant, it's, imp it's about improving the practice so that we can demonstrate progress. There may be one or two blockers in the system, ladies and gentlemen. I just hesitate to mention this as a fact. And one of the great challenges, and again, it, it's true in medicine, it's true in education, it's true in almost any professional practice, is to say 
have you anticipated with the people who will not accept your word? You know, how do you engage with those people? Because it's so easy to become euphoric about what I have found and what we can do. And then you said, is there just the possibility that this might not be as compelling to all of your colleagues? And then, inevitably, a resource issue. How do we make this happen? How do we make this work? If we're talking about really informing practice, then I think something like that checklist, your version of it, is absolutely fundamental. I've gone slightly over time, and I think the final slide is pretty much self-explanatory, because I just want to give you a couple of minutes just to pull any ideas together, and then, if appropriate, some questions and comments, hopefully more comments than questions. But I do think that, in essence, the architecture of learning is the notion that learning is not bounded by periods and days and so on. It's the constant dialogue. How many meetings that take place in school have learning on the agenda? Because that's a, a real giveaway, isn't it, now? To what extent is there evidence that we have sustained professional dialogue around the quality of learning across the school? Do we as a school understand that teaching may not necessarily lead to learning? Because that's a real challenge, isn't it? really is hard. I was in the staff room, a um, young man came in, high fives, punching the air, absolutely delighted. Just taught the best lesson I've ever taught. It's just a pity the children weren't ready for it. <laughs> that's the gap between policy and practice, isn't it? That's when the challenge comes in. <laughs> How do we work in this very complex network? Schools are incredibly complex places. There are so many territorial issues. How do we get them resolved in order to build this one thing which is going to make all the difference in totally pragmatic terms, which is the consistency of a child's experience in terms of good and outstanding teaching and learning? Because that's the, that's the, the bottom line of accountability now, isn't it? Consent, consensus and alignment around values and effective practice. Do we believe? Because if you, if you look at the best practice in any organisation, whether it's a hotel, uh, in a, a restaurant kitchen, in any context you go, airline, whatever, that's what makes the difference, isn't it? And then we're only going to do this if we like each other, if we care about each other, and if we can work together well. That means that if I'm going to change my practice after 30, 40 years as a practitioner, I've really got to trust you. You've got to be credible. And therefore, hopefully, we can say that this is about working to make our school a microcosm of a just society where children have some hope. Because anything else is unacceptable, isn't it? So take a moment or two, if you would, just to reflect if there are any issues that are burning in order to end the day of comment and question and debate. Thank you.